Good morning. It's good to be at Pine Grove this morning. We're good to see all these crowd out here, and it's a good turnout. So we are very, very pleased with that, and very excited about that, and this new way of gathering together to worship. And but we will adjust. We can worship the Lord no matter what, no matter where. So let's uh, join together this morning and sing "Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine." During this time, we need to have Jesus' blessed assurance. So let's uh, let's sing these these words and let these words sink in this morning. is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day. Amen. Well, amen. Good morning. Good to see everyone this morning. Uh, what a beautiful morning that we can gather and have church and worship together this morning. And so we just hope this morning that uh, you've had a great morning in the Lord and so thankful we can gather together this morning. How I do have an announcement this morning. I want to remind everyone that uh, our monthly, the mature life and the home life, Brother Tommy said he would have those for you guys as you go out this morning. So don't forget about that as you go out. He will have those for you, so pick those up if you'd like to have one. He'll also receive the tithe and offering there as, as you leave this morning, so just uh, we're thankful for everybody who's been faithful to give and just keep everything going. I know there are a lot of churches right now having to figure out a lot of things, and the Lord has blessed us tremendously at Pine Grove, so we give him praise, give him glory, give him honor for that this morning. Amen? Good to see you. All right, let's have a word of prayer, and um, then we're going to continue to worship. I think Brother Lane's going to come. I told him I'm going to need a hair bow if uh, this wind keeps up. So y'all just hold on. We'll tie it all down, and we'll worship the Lord together. So let's pray together this morning. Father, we thank you for the privilege to come back together this morning. Lord, we thank you again for, Lord, just your love and your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for the way you protected us, Lord, for the way you've uh, taken care of us, uh, Lord, provided for our every need. We thank you, Lord, today for the, just the great gift of salvation. And, Lord, we just thank you this morning, uh, Lord, that we have our names written in heaven. If we repented and trusted you as Savior, Lord, we pray this morning as we gather to worship that, Lord, as we open your word in a few moments, that, Lord, you would speak to our hearts today. Encourage us, Lord, in these times in which we're living. Lord, we just pray through every song, through every sermon, through, uh, Lord, every, everything we do. Lord, even the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts today, we pray that they might truly glorify and honor the name of Jesus. Lord, we love you today. We thank you for loving us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. remain in control and in the middle of the war you guard my soul you alone are the anchor 
when my sails are torn. Cause your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. When the solid, when the solid ground is falling down from underneath my feet. Between the black skies and my red eyes, I can barely see. And when I realize I've been sold out by my friends and my family, I can feel that rain reminding me that in the eye of the storm, when you remain in control, and in the middle of the war, when you guard my soul, that you alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Cause your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. When my hopes and dreams are far from me and I'm running out of faith, I see the future I picture, it slowly fades away. And when the tears of pain and heartache are pouring down my face, well, I find my peace in Jesus' name. In the eye of the storm, if you remain in control, and in the middle of the war, well, you're God, my soul, and you alone are the anchor when my sails are torn, because your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. comes in the doctor says i've only got a few months left it's like a bitter pill i'm swallowing i can barely take a breath and when addiction steals my baby girl and there's nothing i can do my only hope is to trust you i trust you lord in the eye of the storm but you remain in control and in the middle of the war, you guard my soul. And you alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Cause your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. You remain in control. And in the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor. When my sails are torn, cause your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. In the eye of the storm. In the eye of the storm. I know you're watching me, yeah. The storm is raging, and all my hope is gone. My flesh is failing, still holding on. Oh, oh, oh. when the storm is raging, and all my hope is gone. When my flesh is failing, you're still holding on. Oh, oh, oh. when the storm is raging, and my hope is gone. Even when my flesh is failing. Still holding on. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right path, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. We praise the Lord that in the storm, he's in control in the eye of the storm this morning. I'm thankful today. I, I like it when the Lord puts things together this morning. Um, I, Lane and I haven't talked this week, 
Um, and this morning we're going to be in Acts chapter 27, and it talks about a storm that Paul is in, kind of a, a continuum from last week. <clears throat> and so I want us to look together, be finding your place this morning in Acts chapter 27. In Acts chapter 27, and we're going to read these verses together this morning. And okay, we're going to read them this morning together and uh, look at this storm that Paul's in last Sunday morning. If you remember, we. We uh, talked about the Lord said, you're going to Rome and said, you're going to give testimony of me there and you're going to witness of me and my great name there. And so this is uh, Paul's journey to Rome. So <clears throat> y'all read with me this morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Acts chapter 27, verse one. Stay with me. We've got quite a few verses this morning. I don't normally read this many, but I think for context and for sake of the story, we need to read these verses. So y'all read with me this morning uh, together. It says, and when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. So we entered the ship at Adramatium, and we put out to sea, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia. Aristar Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with us. And the next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. When he had put out to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea, which is off Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of, of Lycia. Then the centurion, there the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy and, we, and put us on board. When we had sailed slowly many days and arrived with great difficulty off Nidus, the wind not permitting us to proceed, we sailed under the shelter of Crete off Salome. Passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lycia. Now, when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because, of the, because the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will, not, will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also, if by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete opening toward the southwest and northwest, and winter there. When the south wind blew softly, supposing that they obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose, called Euryclidon. So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. And running under the shelter of an island called Clauda, we secured the skiff with great difficulty. When they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship, and fearing lest they should run aground on the Sirtis sands, they struck sail, and so were driven. And because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. On the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Now, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. But after a long abstinence from food, Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the Lord to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid. Paul, you must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore take heart, men, and I believe God that and for I for I believe God that it would be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on, on a certain island. Now when the fourteenth night had come, as we were driven up and down the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors sensed that we were drawing near to some land. And they took soundings and found it to be twenty fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they took soundings again and found that it, it to be fifteen fathoms. Then fearing lest we run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship when they had let down the skiff into the sea under the pretense of putting out anchors from the prow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it fall. And as day was about to dawn, Paul implored them all to take food for, and saying, Today is the fourteenth day you have waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. Therefore I urge you to take nourishment, for this is your survival, since not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks, and th gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then they were all encouraged and took food for themselves. 
and, uh, and in all were 276 persons on the ship. So when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and threw out the weed into the sea. When it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they observed a bay with a beach onto which they planned to run the ship if possible. And they let go of the anchors and left them in the sea. Meanwhile, loosing the rudder ropes, they hoisted the mainsail to the wind and made for shore. But striking a place where the two seas met, they ran the ship aground and the prow stuck fast and remained immovable. But the stern was being broken apart by the violence of the waves. And the soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land, and the rest, some on boards and some on parts of the ship. And so it was that they all escaped safely to land. As I read these verses this morning, I can't help but think about Wednesday night we talked, and I preached from Hebrews 6 there. In the Bible, we talked about uh, Sunday night, or Wednesday night, excuse me, that we all have a hope today. Uh, we talked about that hope that is an anchor for our soul, that it is sure, that it is steadfast, and it speaks there even of the one who enters the presence behind the veil. We know that to be Jesus. We know that he is our high priest. He is the one that went into the holy place and made atonement for our sins, spiritually speaking. Uh, we can go to heaven this morning because of Jesus Christ and what he did for us at the cross. Hope this morning is the medicine for discovery discouraged Christians and it's what we need Christ is the forerunner as we read as we read in Hebrews 6 there and it's a military word it means one who runs reconnaissance and I thought about that again this week preparing for this morning the Lord is the one who went before us he scouted the land he's faced the enemy he's seen what lies ahead and he overcame and because he overcame we can too and we can follow him this morning he's ascended back to heaven and we're going there one day and as I said Wednesday night there's an anchor today we don't anchor to a, a, a murky lake bottom or we don't anchor to the shifting sands of the sea uh, the bottom of the sea but we anchor to the throne of God this morning and that's where our lives are anchored today and so we see just like in our text this morning there are four anchors that's been dropped from the stern and I want us to go again this morning and look at these anchors and see some more anchors of hope and so I hope this morning you'll leave encouraged as I said last Sunday morning as we studied in Acts 23 and verse 11 Paul there being in prison being in chains uh, the, the angel of the Lord came and stood by him that night and said, Be of good cheer, uh, for you've testified of me in Jerusalem, and you're also going to Rome. And so he was working with the promise of God, and the Lord says you're going to make it. And when the Lord says you're going to make it, you're going to make it. Amen? It might not always look like it, might not always feel like it, but when the Lord says you're going to make it, you're going to make it. And so hang on to the promise of God's word, and just like Paul did, just like Abraham did as we talked about him on Sunday, uh, Wednesday night. Since chapter 22 of the book of Acts there, Paul's been a prisoner. He'll no longer be a free man in the flesh, but he is a free man in the spirit. We live in a free nation today, and uh, though uh, physically we may be free, there are many today bound spiritually. Many today are not free spiritually. And the Bible says in John 8 and verse 36 there that if the Son makes you free, he says you will be free indeed. And so this morning we can rejoice in the freedom that God has given us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so we pray this morning, you know the Lord, that you've been set free. Many today are still caught up in a, in a, a bondage, if you will. Uh, still this morning caught up in addiction. We see that drugs and alcohol still wreak havoc on families today. Uh, certain prescription medications today are wreaking havoc on homes and lives. And so men and women are not free, and they need freedom that comes from Jesus Christ and that only he can give. Some are, are given over this day and age to sexual sins. And we see uh, so many things going on sexually, so many things changing from what God's Word said, that marriage is husband and wife, man and, man and woman, male and female. And so there are those caught up in the addiction of pornography today and so many things that they need to be set free from. There's that bondage of greed, and we see there are many today. Uh, the love of money is the root of all evil. And the list can go on and on and on this morning to those who are, are, are in bondage to sin and in bondage to Satan. And so we, we remind ourselves today that if we know Jesus, we don't have to live in bondage. We can live free, and we are free. Because if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. And Paul had that great freedom uh, as we read this morning and as we'll see today. Now, I remember a time in my life when uh, I, I thought I was free. 
uh, there was a time in my life when, when there were chains that I was bound up in, and, and uh, I thought I was free. I could live the way I wanted to, do what I wanted to, act how I wanted to act. But looking back, I wasn't free. I was bound. Those things had a control over my life. And when I came to Jesus, I can testify today I'm free indeed. So this is the story this morning of the Apostle Paul on his way to Rome on his way to give testimony of Jesus Christ. And boy, what a great story it is this morning that we can read together and we can share together. One of the great proofs, if you need it, that the Bible is true. One of the great scriptures that testify of the truth and the authenticity of the Word of God is right here in this passage. Uh, as you read these texts this morning and as you study this, there are so many things today that we can look and we can find historically. This is the way uh, seamanship worked in those days. Uh, it's an exact uh, replica of what they would do in this time and this age. And it just proves historically that, that the Bible is true, if you need proof this morning. Uh, let me just say this. The Bible always stands up to uh, scholarly study. So many have tried to disprove what this book says, but I'm telling you this morning, they'll never do it. It'll always be true, and it'll always prove itself to be true every time. I read somewhere even that the, the midshipmen at the Naval Academy in Annapolis have to study this or read this passage because it speaks of ancient seamanship and it, it, it like no other chapter does or, or has in the Bible. So it's a story this morning of danger on the high seas. It's a story this morning of deliverance by the God of heaven. It's a story of shipwreck, and I, I say this all the time. If you're looking for a good romance novel, read your Bible. If you're looking for action and drama, read your Bible. If you're looking for excitement, read your Bible. We say, well, in these days, it's kind of boring. Listen, get your Bible out. This is one of the greatest stories, one of the greatest chapters in the Scriptures this morning, and I'm excited that we can study it together today. There are so many storms in the Bible. Uh, we read about Jonah getting caught up and tossed overboard. The great fish came by and ate him. And, uh, of course, he puked him up that he could go and eventually do what God had called him to do. There were the disciples who were caught on a, a storm out in the, on the lake there, and the Lord was with them. And, and even sometimes storms arise with Jesus with us, and so we trust him. They don't scare him. Uh, he's in complete control of them. And so I, I see these storms, and I've been watching the news these last few weeks, and, and it, it when WIS says tornado, my anxiety levels raise. My blood pressure goes up. I've been in some tornadoes. I don't like them. If the Lord would deliver me from everyone until the day I go to heaven, that will be fine with me. I don't like them. And so in the storms, uh, many times there's anxiety and there's a helplessness that comes over our life. Sometimes the storms in our life are our own making. Sometimes we, we, we shoot ourselves in the foot, so to speak. Uh, we'll do something like Jonah and get outside the will of God or, or, or not go where God may tell us to go. And so there's so many things that in the storms of life we can kind of hurt our own self with these storms. And sometimes these storms come by divine providence that God allows them. And he allows them to come into our life so that we might be strengthened in our faith, that we might grow in our character, that we might grow closer to him. We say these seafaring terms all the time, the anchor holds, and it does. We say so many times that, we, that 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 was smooth sailing, and it is so many times for us. We'll say, well, it's sink or swim time, and that's kind of where Paul's at this morning as we study these verses. I tell you, I think about in our own lives today, uh, we were supposed to go on a cruise back in, in April there, and uh, as we were getting ready to go, all this broke out, and so we didn't get to go, and we didn't get to uh, uh, take, take that, that vacation and, and go out on the high seas there, if you will. I thought about uh, in our lives, there were many ports of call that we were going to make. We were going to stop here. We'd be at sea for a day, and we'd, we'd port here. I thought about this morning, what is your port of call? There's only two this morning, only two, heaven or hell. And so this morning, if you can say it this way on this voyage, on this life we're traveling, there are only two ports that we can make. You can make heaven because of Jesus. Or you can make hell because you reject Jesus. Don't reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You don't want to do that this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 19 there says this, Cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately violated their consciences. As a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. I can tell you in my years of ministry, in my own life, there have been times that, that I've seen folks that have been shipwrecked in their faith 
because they got too close to the rocks and to the ledge and they didn't anchor their lives completely in the Lord. Second Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6 says, For I am being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul said the time is coming. We're going to hoist the anchor. We're going to sail into the port of glory. Church, what a day that's going to be when the Lord comes for us and we can raise anchor here and we can sail in the glory on the hope and the promise of God's word today. We sing these songs, Jesus, Savior, pilot me over life's tempestuous sea. We sing one of my favorites so many times, keep me safe till the storm passes by. And so this morning, this voyage that Paul is on, we discover there are winds, there's anchors, there's some boards they're clinging to, and we can't help but see the storm. And as the writer writes there, if you look with me in verse 4, he says the winds were contrary, kind of like they are this morning, but, but worse, right? Uh, he says in verse 7, they arrived with great difficulty. If you look in verse 13 and 14, said the south wind blew softly, but not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose, a nor'easter there. The wind came from the north and from the east. And if you've ever been on the cruise and, or a cruise and you've walked out on the bow of the ship, you know what that headwind is like. You know that wind, you almost have to lean forward to walk into the wind that's coming your way as you get out on the open sea. And so Paul said there's a, a headwind that arose. And he said we were driven up and down, all around. They didn't know where they were going. They just knew the wind was carrying them. And, and it's really by divine providence, providence, even when we don't always understand, God works out his plan. Even when we don't in our life always uh, can raise the sail and point the, the bow of our ship, spiritually speaking, in the direction we want to go, God still has a wind that can blow, that leads and guides and directs our lives, as we'll see in a few moments today, in just a few moments today. Soft winds, he says they blew. Uh, so many times there are delightful winds in our life, aren't they? Just a soft wind that blows. God leading, directing our lives. So many times uh, the ship's not threatened. It might be rocked a little bit. But so many times there is that, that tempestuous wind that, that blows in our lives. It's been said, and I'll remind you again this morning, you're either in a storm, you're coming out of a storm, or you're about to go into a storm. It's always true. It's always true. We trust the Lord even in the storms of our life today. There's been some statements made by some political leaders of our nation in these days. Uh, some this week that, that have been made, some last week that were made. And folks, listen, there, there's always a headwind blowing against the gospel, blowing against Christianity. There's always, since the day of the early church, the infancy of the early church, since the day the Lord Jesus walked the earth, there's always been a headwind. There's always been resistance. But we, we march forward and we trust him in it, and we proclaim the gospel, and we live it with every fiber of our being, and we tell folks no matter what, uh, they believe no matter how they feel that Jesus is alive, that he is our Savior, that we're headed to heaven, and they can go with us if they'll trust him. God will just doesn't want us today to go through a storm, but he wants us to grow through it. And if you're going through something today, and I'm sure many of you in, in, a, in a group this size, you're going through something, God doesn't just want to see you struggle. He doesn't just want to see you hurt or be discouraged. He wants you to grow through it. And as we go through it, we grow through it. I thought about the Lord there on the ship. Uh, he woke up and he spoke up and he stoked up their faith. And that's what he wants to do for us in these days and this time today. So we praise the Lord for this great, great truth that we have in the Word of God this morning. Look with me again at verse 10 and 11. Paul says, men, I perceive this voyage is going to end with disaster. He said the ship, the cargo, he says, but also the lives. Then in verse 11, the centurion persuaded by the helmsman and the, and the owner, he says more than what Paul has spoken, they set sail. And so we see here in the storm, they're going through it, but God wants them to grow through it. Look at verse 21 with me just for a moment. But after long absences, Paul stood in the midst of them and said, men, you should have listened. And we shouldn't have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and this loss. Look at verse 30. Some of the sailors seeking to escape said when they let down the skiff under pretense of putting out anchors from the prow, Paul said to the centurion and soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. We see they're going in the storm, but they're growing through it. At one point, Paul said all lives are going to be lost. But if you look with me again, as we read there in verse 24, he says, the Lord has granted all who sail with you. So even in the storm, Paul is going, but he's growing. At one point, he said, the ship's going to be lost, the cargo's lost, lives are lost. But then the Lord showed up and gave him a word, and he said, men, be of good cheer, take heart. 
we're all going through, for God has said it. The poor centurion there looked and said, I don't care what you say, Paul. We're going with the man who knows how to sell this vessel, and we're, we're leaving. But then we get down later in the scripture there, and Paul tells him to do some things, and Paul really becomes the commander of the ship. God has given him divine uh, overseers of this ship, and they're listening to him. They're growing, if you will, through the storm because they're trusting what God is doing through this man, Paul, and God has given him a great word there. How's it going for you through the storm this morning? Are you growing through this storm? I believe God wants us today to grow through the storms that we're in. What is the Lord speaking to your heart? How is he strengthening your faith? In 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 25 there, Paul had already been shipwrecked three times. Three times. And he doesn't want to be again, although he will be. And I think about this story this morning that Paul leading these folks. And the Bible says there as they go through this storm that the weight of the cargo there is weighing it down. And look with me in verse 18 again. It said they lightened the ship. Look at verse 19. It says on the third day, three days later, we threw out the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. In the storm of life and in our lives this morning, God brings us to a place, and he's brought me to a place so many times that we got to lighten the load. Amen? We find out what is truly a necessity in our life in the storms. We find out what we need and what we don't need. And I can tell you I found out some things that I don't need during the storm that we're in. I found some things that I do need. I need my faith in my Savior. Amen? I, I need my strength that comes from him. I need his peace that passes all understanding. Listen, if ever a time I realized I need my church family, it's now. I tell you, we miss our church family. We miss each other, and we can't wait for the time that we can get back together. And so it says they lighten the load. They literally started throwing things overboard so that the ship would not sink, so they could endure the storm and move forward there uh, going on this journey to Rome. And so I see this morning in our lives, God may be asking us that we might be under great duress and stress at sea this morning. In this voyage we're on, maybe this morning we need to lighten our load. Maybe this morning we need to get rid of some things. And maybe this morning there's some things we still need to confess and trust the Lord with. It's a time of getting rid of sin. It's a time that sin weighs us down and shackles us. And it's a time we repent and turn to the Lord. We always read 2 Chronicles 7:14, And we could all probably this morning uh, quote that by, by heart. But the verse we don't always read is verse 13 right above that. You know, verse 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Listen to verse 13. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. He said when there's troubles and trials and struggles that come to my people in their land, he says my people ought to pray. They're to humble themselves. They're to seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. And so this morning, the storm builds our prayer life. It builds our praise life. Y'all read with me a few moments ago, Paul broke bread and he gave thanks to God. In the middle of the storm, hear me this morning, you can still praise the God of heaven. There's still good things today we can see and we can praise him for. And it, it strengthens our personal relationship with the Lord. So Paul tells them to do some things. And, and look with me in verse 16 there. It says, and running under the shelter of an island called Clauda, we secured the skiff with great difficulty. When they had taken it on board, meaning the, the lifeboat there that they often towed behind, they took it on board. They used cables to undergird the ship, lest fearing they should run aground on the Sirtis sands. They, they struck sail, and so they were driven. So they brace up. They pull in the skiff. They brace up, if you will, the ship there. And then we read over in the other verses, they drop four anchors later in the story. I thought about that this morning. They're, they brace up the ship. Why? Because they know the storm is going to be brutal. They know the storm is going to be tough. And so they're bracing up the ship, and they take in the skiff, and they use those cables to undergird it. Let me put it this way. Like a big old belt for the belly of the ship, all right? They, they, they tighten it up. They firm it up. They secure it up. And I thought about in our lives today, we brace up our lives. First Peter says, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. It's time to tighten up some thinking, amen, to get our, sight, our sights and our thoughts on the Lord Jesus and keep them there and turn to him and allow him to, to, to do great things in our lives. It means that we get rid of loose, sloppy thinking. Ephesians 6 and verse 14, stand therefore. 
How do we stand in a time like this? He says, having girded your waist with truth, that belt there of truth that we read about with the armor of God, it, it, it's the center, supposedly, uh, supposed to be, I should say. It's the center of the garment. And he says, put on that belt. That's the center. What is the belt? It's the belt of truth. And we put on and have our lives today and everything about us uh, compassed and circled, closed up with truth, the Word of God this morning. And I'm thankful that God's given us His Word today. We center on truth. What does the Bible say? It's truth. How do we live? It's truth. How do we go forward? It's truth, the Word of God. Paul says in Philippians 4 and verse 8, some of my favorite verses that, that I truly need to practice more. I think we all could. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable or of, of a good report, if it is any excellent or praiseworthy, think, meditate on these things. Paul says there, listen, they girded up the ship, they tightened up the ship, they, they secured the ship. And in our lives today, we gird up the loins of our minds. We put on the belt of truth. We draw it tight, if you will. We think on the things that are good, the things that are right, the things that are holy, of a good report. God's allowing, I believe, our lives to be braced up. I believe he's allowing our homes to be braced up during this time. I really do. I see a lot of homes and a lot of families uh, tightening up. Can I say it that way? I see a lot of homes and a, a lot of families there, a lot of marriages uh, tightening up. And if there's ever a time that we need to brace up and tighten up our homes, our marriages, um, it's this day and this time. I know some husbands and wives, you probably think, preacher, we're about ready to take each other out. Amen. These kids are getting on our nerves. We're getting on each other's nerves. Listen, God has allowed this. Brace it up. Lean on one another. Just enjoy the time that you have and know that it's a gift from God, even though we can't do everything we want to do this morning. I think that the Lord this morning is, is allowing us to brace up the church. I really believe that the church will be stronger through this. I believe we really, if there's ever a time I know in my own life that, that I can truly say that, that I really miss and need the church. Well, I tell you, we miss it, don't we? And can't wait for the time that we can get back together. I, I think it's going to help us realize that there are many ways that we can reach a world that needs the gospel. There are so many avenues just this morning by social media and by using our YouTube channel and streaming and, and all kinds of ways that we're using uh, just technology to get the gospel out. I believe the Lord's going to brace the church up in these times. He's bracing our lives up. The Bible says that we ought to be strengthened in the inner man, and God's doing a great work that we might come to the fullness of our Savior today. I don't think that what we're going through is just for us. Many of you who are older than I am have been through some difficult days. You've seen some trials and battles, and it was for you. It was for your strength and your faith, but it wasn't just for you. It was for those who would come after and the generations to come that you could give testimony and you could give glory to God that he's able, that he's faithful, and that he's going to see you through. I rejoice in that this morning. I think about in Deuteronomy. We read a few weeks ago on a Wednesday night, Deuteronomy 6. And in that text, he says, you know, you write them on the doorpost of you. You put them on your hands. You, you, you say them when you get up, when you go to bed, on the doorpost of your home. And you keep God's word, these commandments close. But as you read on, at, down and later in those verses, he says that when your children ask, what do these things mean? He said, you tell them that the Lord brought us out of Egypt that he might bring us into the land of promise. And I'm telling you today, in your life and my life, it's a great testimony that the Lord's bringing us out, that he's going to take us in, that the generation to come, when they say, what was all that about? We can say, we can tell you God did this and God done that. And it's individual for every home and every life. But God's doing some great things in our midst today. So we see it's for us for generations to come. Look with me again, verse 27 through verse 29 there says they took soundings they found it to be 20 fathoms a fathom is six feet so he says they took they took soundings 20 fathoms and they'd gone a little farther they took 15 or took soundings again it was 15 then fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come i read those verses you read in chapter 28 that they're near the island of a place called malta there and you can look that up today it's by divine providence that they make it here They've been tossed to and fro. 
They've been just drifting. They've, they've raised the anchors. They've lowered. The, listen, they've just sailed with the wind. And one little spot on the map, one little place on the map, out of all that sea, God directed them to. There's no other way they got there, no other way they could make it there other than but the divine providence of the God of heaven. And I want to remind you, as I said earlier, there, listen, don't know where you're going, but it's by God's divine providence that he's leading. Sometimes we get to a place and we look back and we say, boy, the hand of God directed me there. The hand of God led me there, and we can rejoice in that. It said, when the 14th night had come, we were driven up and down. And about midnight, that the sailors sensed that we were drawing near to some land. They heard the, the shore, the, the waves crashing on the sea. They knew that the time was getting close, and so they took those soundings there. And as they did, they would drop this big bell-like uh, weight. And it, it had markings on it. So they would drop it to see how deep the water. They got about 120 feet. They got about 90 feet. Some believe they were about three miles off the coast there. And so God led them there. When they get there, they drop those four anchors off the back, off the stern of the ship. Now, listen, normally we would anchor off the bow of the ship. But they drop four off the back. They point the nose, the bow of the ship toward land because when day comes, they're going to cut those anchors and they're sailing in to run the ship aground that they might be safe there in that place. And so we see this morning these four anchors. And I want to share with you very quickly, very quickly in closing, four anchors this morning that, that we can trust, that we can let down, spiritually speaking, this morning, that we can, uh, I guess we say we hang on, but really they, they hang on to us, that we can drop these anchors this morning. So let's look with me again just very quickly. Let me share the four anchors there that they drop. I'm, I'm this just spiritually this morning, all right? Number one, the anchor of God's purpose. I thought about Paul. He said, you're going to Rome, and you're going to give testimony of me. And in the storms of life, we can hold on and we can drop the anchor of God's purpose. I want you to know this morning, I want you to hear every heart, every home, every person, and every car. God has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for you. Someone may tell you you don't have a purpose. They may make you feel insignificant. But I want you to know this morning, God has a plan and a purpose. In fact, Jeremiah said, the Lord said to him, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Think about that this morning. Everybody in every car, every life, before you were even formed in the mother's womb, God knew you. God knew you. Not only that, it gets better. He said, before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. In other words, Jeremiah, uh, you're going to preach the gospel. You're going to go to the nations. The man wasn't even formed in the womb yet. Think about this this morning, every life. Get excited about God has a, a plan and a purpose. And in the storms of life, when the doubts creep in, when the discouragement creeps in, when the despair creeps in, know this this morning. God has a purpose. And it will see you through, I promise, in the difficult days. You say, Brother Eric, I'm dealing with some physical sickness. God has a plan and God has a purpose. Someone says, well, Brother Eric, I'm dealing with a financial problem. Can I remind you, God has a plan. God has a purpose. Someone says this morning, well, my family's going through some things. Listen, God has a plan, and God has a purpose. Trust God in these times. Trust God. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, he says, for the joy of the cross that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame that he would incur there. I think about Jesus. How could he go to the cross knowing what he would face and endure and endure the great shame with joy. Because I believe the Lord knew, and I know he did, that there would be multiplied millions who would come to faith in Jesus. He said, I can go to the cross. I can take that beating. I can take all this ridicule. I can take all this rejection. I can take it all. Because here's the greater picture. I have a purpose from my Father in heaven to do the work that he sent me to do, to die for the sins of humanity so they don't have to go to a place called hell. I'm telling you, God has a plan today for your life, for our lives today. Romans 8 and verse 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Doesn't even compare to the glory. Secondly, the anchor of our God's throne this morning. Psalm 45 and verse 6 says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Throw the anchor this morning toward heaven. Amen? Throw it toward 
the throne of God. And I promise you'll never drift. You'll hold on. It's secure. There's the anchor of God's word this morning. Isaiah 40 and verse 8 says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. You want to anchor your life to something? Listen, you can anchor it to the purpose God's called you to. You can anchor it to the throne of God. And you can anchor it to the word of God this morning. We read in Hebrews 6, Wednesday night, it's impossible for our God to lie. God can't lie. He's true. And I promise you, if you anchor it to his word, you'll, you'll, you'll endure the storms of life. Then lastly, fourthly, the anchor of God's church. The Lord said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Oh, listen, you need the church. And I'd say to anyone watching, listen, you need a church family. And I want to encourage you, if you don't have a church family, we'd love for you to come join Pine Grove. You need a church family. I don't know how people weather a storm without church family. I'm thankful for my church family at Pine Grove this morning. You don't know how much, <laughs> but I'm thankful this morning. We need the church. We need the church family. And God's given us an anchor for times of storms. Those who love us and care for us and pray for us and encourage us. and earn the, I'm telling you, it's awesome this morning what God is doing and what he's given us. That ship runs aground, and the Bible says those who could swim, they swam the shore. Those who couldn't, they grabbed onto some boards and floated to the shore. They made it in safely, the Bible says. I'm thankful this morning that uh, those boards could represent the promise of God. Listen, we can hold on to them, and we can trust them. Paul says there in those verses, be of good cheer, take heart. God has not only, listen, the ship might be destroyed, but God's given us the lives of all. We can be happy and be cheerful and take heart today. The Bible says when the sun didn't shine, the stars didn't shine, they lost all hope. Did y'all remember that? Lost all hope. No hope whatsoever. But the angel of the Lord appeared and said, take heart. Be of good cheer. Y'all going to make it. <laughs> That's my translation. <laughs> Y'all going to make it. We going to make it. So cheer up. Praise the Lord. Even the worst thing today for the believer, the worst thing today that I can think of that could happen in our minds, physically, humanly speaking, is death. But yet the Bible declares in 1 Corinthians 15, says, O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? But thanks be to our God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The very worst thing that we can think of, fleshly speaking, is death. And the Bible says we don't even have to fear that because Jesus has overcome that. So we can even be cheerful knowing that at death we're ushered into his presence. Praise the Lord this morning. There's no storm too great for the anchor of heaven, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray you know him today. If you don't know Jesus, oh, I'll give your life to him. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Do it today. Listen, this is simple as saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. I realize you are the Son of God who died for my sins. And, Lord, I want to confess you as my Lord and Savior today. Forgive me, Lord, and live in my life, direct my path. It's that simple today. If you do know him, rejoice, because in any storm, he's in the ship. The anchor holds, and we can trust it. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this great word this morning. I thank you, Lord, that your word is truth. Lord, your word is power. Your word is our authority. Your word is our anchor today. So, Lord, we hold to the anchor. We thank you, Lord, that the anchor holds. And so, Lord, I pray for, again, every heart and every home. I pray, Lord, for the struggles, for the strains. Uh, Lord, I pray that in these times that, Lord, you just continue, Lord, to draw us to your word and do a work in our life. Remember, Lord, and recall to our minds the purpose we have, and that's, Lord, to be your witness. And, Lord, to tell others, Lord, that you're faithful and you're true. Thank you, Lord, for the life of the Apostle Paul, Lord, as he's going to Rome to give testimony. Lord, you saw him through, directed him, Lord, to a little island, a little spot of land there in the Mediterranean Ocean. So, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your divine providence in our life, for your leading, your guiding, and your directing. And, Lord, I pray for someone who might hear this message, that, Lord, they might be directed, Lord, to trust and give their life to you, repent of their sins. And, Lord, we just pray, Lord, for those who might hear it and who know you, that they've been encouraged in their walk of faith. Lord, we love you today. We thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.